prove that message. So, <laughs> hallelujah. What a day that's going to be. You know, you ought to start getting to practice right now, though. We're in a series of messages entitled The Last of the Last Days, which I believe with all my heart that we are in those last of the last days. We may well be in the last of the last, last days. <laughs> so let some of you think about that for a moment. But the time is drawing near when we're going to see some great things that, that, that like we've never seen before in history. In fact, I believe, like at no other time in human history before, are we seeing the intervention of God the way that we're seeing it in the world today. Closest we have come to this where we're at in the world today, and I believe in the times that we live in, the closest where we could kind of compare ourselves to would be the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, just before he came. What God was doing in the world and the atmosphere and the cosmos in that moment, with what some would call the Advent season that we're in, the first coming of Jesus Christ, to where we are very close to the second coming of Jesus Christ. God's moving in the world today in, in an incredible rate. Soon we're going to see things happen, and I believe it, even more an escalated pace as we draw closer to these last days. In the series of messages, just number six in our series, I'll be doing two more. Next Sunday we'll be talking about a comparison between the first coming, the first advent, the first arrival of Jesus, and compare it in Scripture with the second coming of Jesus Christ. But not only will we do some comparison, we'll also look at some contrast, some things that are different. And we'll also kind of give you an overview of some last day events. Uh, some people say, why don't you preach about Christmas? This is the second Christmas. <laughs> All right. This is the second Christmas. This is Jesus coming again. And next week we'll do that comparison and get a little closer into it. But as we're looking at Scripture today, we're going to be looking at the tribulation. I know we talked about the rapture and some of those events, but give some more clarity to this time that we're in and the Antichrist and some of the things that will happen in the last days. So hope you brought your, your brain with you today. Put it on. Open it up. Get it ready. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we're reading from today. We're looking at verses 1 through 5. And this is a, a section of scripture that contains some truth really found nowhere else in the Bible. And I think it's real key uh, to understanding a lot of the events uh, uh, concerning the last days of time and how the Lord's going to operate in these last days. And it's central, obviously, to the letter that Paul was writing. He kind of builds everything to this moment as, as he's writing this, this letter to the Thessalonians, his second letter, by the way. He says, now we request you, brethren with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as from us as to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. It goes on to say, let no one deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction or perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all, uh, above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displays himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? In fact, you can even go to his first letter where he's telling them these things. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, about the first 11 verses of that chapter, He's reviewing some of the events of the last days. And I want you to know the day of the Lord is going to come. And when he comes, he's going to come like a thief in the night. And people will be saying peace and safety. And sudden destruction is going to come upon them. So he's laying out some information, some more information about these days. He's already spoken to them. He said, when I was there, I spoke to you about this. Now I've written to you twice about this. Now why is he focusing on this with the Thessalonians? Because there was a lot of confusion. In fact, there's this real state of confusion they were living in in regard to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he, he had instructed them concerning this time. In fact, he said concerning the day of the Lord is the terminology he, he used. And when he spoke to them in person and now writing to them twice. In fact, the day of the Lord is, is, is a terminology that they should have been very familiar with. It's a period of history mentioned in the Old Testament during which God is going to bring judgment upon all the nations and upon the end of time, followed by great millennial blessings from the Lord Jesus Christ during that millennial reign. You know, it's, it's, it's a dr dr dramatic time, it's a drastic time, but also a glorious time as it ends up. He, he dealt with that in Isaiah, he talks about the day of the Lord, 
In Zephaniah, he talks about the day of the Lord. Uh, from other New Testament re revelations, he's using that same terminology about the day of the Lord. When is the day of the Lord? I believe the day of the Lord is that period of time right after the rapture of the church that includes the tribulation, the judgments, the vows, the wrath that comes, and then on into the millennial reign. Now, in his first letters, I said, when Paul talked to them, he, he mentions the day of the Lord then and talks about what would happen. But something else has gone on in the midst. Somebody has gotten on the scene in Thessalonica and begin telling everybody, uh, we're in the tribulation. The tribulation's come, and now we're in the midst of it. And you can kind of understand that because the Lord had talked about tribulation times and difficult days. And, you know, a lot of people don't, can't separate the, the uh, difference between persecution of the saints and the tribulation time. Saints have gone through persecution for centuries, all right? First century church went through tremendous persecution. And because they saw this persecution going on, a lot of people are saying, hey, we're, in the, you know, we're in the middle of the tribulation. This is it. People are losing their lives. The Romans are killing people. They're dragging people out of their homes. This is it. This is tribulation. But it wasn't the tribulation. In fact, I remember one of my first trips to Bulgaria, I was asked to speak to the pastor's conference regarding the second coming and just go over a general outline of the end times, kind of like what we've been doing here. And I remember about the second time I got up to preach in that conference, boy, there was a lot of stirring going on and a lot of different opinions were going on. In fact, I had one preacher get right up in the middle of my sermon and, you know, call me out on something. Uh, it was in Bulgarian, so it didn't offend me, so I couldn't understand it. But somebody translated, so what did he say? And he told me, and I basically, just, you know, politely asked him to sit down. I'd answer all his questions and... Uh, and so we went through that. But there was, a, there were, you know, a lot of people had, you know, their idea of the tribulation and persecution that they had gone through were kind of mingled in. And those guys had suffered a lot under communism. Many have lost, people had lost their lives. Many churches had lost their pastors. A lot of pastors had lost family members. So uh, I think the same kind of scenario was going on in Thessalonica. They felt, with well, all this is happening, certainly we must be in the tribulation. People are dying around here. But Jesus did say that, you know, in the last days are going to be difficult days. And he even told us those that live godly shall suffer. There's going to be suffering persecution because you live for Jesus Christ. That still goes on today. There's a great percentage of the world that's under terrible persecution for their faith and their belief in Jesus Christ that give their lives on a regular basis because of their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the, th th it's hard to say this morning, and you need to bear with me, especially be patient today, because... Uh, I have all this stuff, you know, in my head. Did you ever get that? And then you get it all up in your ears where you can hear yourself talk. Listen, I'm going to make my sermon shorter now that I've heard myself. <laughs> <laughs> I've already heard myself preach once today, and it's driving me crazy. It's going to kind of like vibrate in your ears. And, but <laughs> anyway, we're going we're to get through all that, all right? But the idea is that Thessalonians, they, they'd gotten this instruction from somebody, and we'll talk about in a moment how it was coming to them. And so it was just a popular idea. And so Paul's writing them again. He said, hey, you need to understand. And he starts reminding them. Literally, he, he talks to them about four different things, and he, he kind of brings these up as, as, as he talks to them. He said, I'm going to talk to you about the coming of the Lord. I want to talk to you about the day of the Lord in verse 2. And he says, I'm going to talk to you about the apostasy that has to come over in verse 3. And then through 3, through the last the verse we read there, verse 5, he, says, he talks to them about the lawless one and gives more description to the, the, the apostate leader, the Antichrist himself. So let's kind of look at this this morning and see how he clears up a lot of confusion. I, I really believe there's a lot of confusion even today about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you take the time and you look at the Word, it's amazing how he simplifies so much that's in it when you take the time to study it and to read it. Let's look, he says in verse 1, Now we, we request you, brethren... With regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. So here he launches into the subject of the, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he'd already touched on again in, in, in chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. But he wants, he wants to correct something and he, he's, he's beseeching them that they take a moment, let's get over the confusion, let's see what's going on here. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together unto him. In fact, he uses two terms there as he talks about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He talks about first, he says, hey, I want to talk to you about in regard. The translation could literally read like this, on behalf of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he uses another term. And also I want to talk to you about our gathering together unto him, which refers specifically to 
and strategically, I believe, to the rapture, which he's mentioned in other places about our gathering together under the Lord Jesus Christ. Both of these phrases are interpreted as referring to the coming of Jesus, but he, he ties them together with this, this, the, these nouns together with an article indicating that they are two parts of one event. There's going to be this coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and a part of that coming of the Lord Jesus Christ of all these last days, the coming of Christ, there's going to be this gathering together under the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's trying to say, you haven't missed the gathering together because this other is going to come first. These other things have to happen first. And so, you know, this parousia of Jesus making himself known, his presence is going to happen. In fact, the word there for coming is the word parousia. And it's used a lot of times in Scripture in re referring to the Lord's appearing, where he makes himself known. In fact, the Latin equivalent to this word parousia from the Greek language, the Latin word is, is, is a word you may be more familiar with. It's the word we get our word advent from. When people talk about the Lord's advent, the Lord's making his presence known, his first presence being manifest was the, in Bethlehem when he came as a man and took upon the form of a man. He, he was the perfect God, perfect man, perfect God, man, man, God. All right, there he was, and that was his first advent. This is a time of year when a lot of churches will celebrate what they do ad, with, with Advent. And it's kind of a, it, it's not a sacred ceremony such as the baptism. It's not a sacrament like the Lord's Supper. But it is something people do to practice. People say, why don't we do the Advent candles and stuff? It, it's just, it's nice. It's not something the Lord's told us to do, all right? Uh, it's celebratory, but it's ritual, okay? It's not necessarily what God has told the church to do. So, it can be done. There's nothing wrong with doing it. It's just something that we don't do. Uh, I was in a church, uh, you may have missed a Sunday ago, where I, I preached in a church, and they were doing the Advent candles, and each Sunday they light another candle for a certain part of recognizing the Advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Paul's talking. He said, I, I don't want you to be ignorant about the Advent, this parousia, this second Advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. I beseech you, I'm going to inform you of what's going on here. And it's important, he says, that you understand how this whole thing works. And he starts laying out some things for them to understand. And he refers to it, the day of the Lord. Don't be quickly shaken from your composure. Don't be disturbed by spirit, by message, or a letter as if from us to the effect of the day of the Lord has come. Don't, in other words, don't lose your cool. Chill out. You're not in the tribulation. Yes, things are difficult, but there are false teachers out there that are telling you that this great tribulation has come and it has not come. The day of the Lord is coming, though. Now, the day of the Lord was a term, as we say, was used in the Old Testament a lot as well as in the New Testament. And the day of the Lord in the Old Testament was an expression that occurred 20 different times in different locations. Sometimes it's referred to as the last days, 14 times. And another hundred places through the Old Testament, it talks about in that day, making reference to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord would comprise several things. That taking away the church, the beginning of the judgments, mostly was the reference to it, and the millennial reign of the Lord in that day. Following the rapture, when all those vials of wrath that we went over a, a couple of weeks ago were poured out, all that judgment comes upon the earth. Then there's that moment of the great tribulation, the last three and a half years. All that falls under this particular banner, the day of the Lord. It refers to a period of unprecedented judgment poured out successively on the earth that covered a span of seven years. So he said, hey, that hasn't happened yet. All right, so don't, don't, don't be shaken in your mind. There's going to be this period of seven years. There's going to be, it's going to be crisis in the world. It's going to be difficult in the world, you know, but it hasn't happened. In fact, he says, I don't care who tells you, and I don't care where this comes from. And I love the way Paul does this, you know, because he makes it clear that, that God's word is clear, and if anybody else says anything that's contrary to what God has already said, don't believe it. Remember he talked to the Galatians, he says, Who has bewitched you, O foolish Galatians, that you would receive another Jesus or another spirit? All right? So, so, hey, stick to the truth. It doesn't change. You can count on God. You can count on God's word. You can believe God's word. Stay with what you've heard. In fact, he says, you know, this, this word has come to you in different ways and through different channels. He says, it may be by spirit, it may have come through, through a report or by word, or it may come by letter, even as for me. Don't believe it. In fact, the idea of spirit here is that the, it, it, it kind of carries the, the, uh, the, 
the general idea that somebody stood up in the assemblies of the Thessalonians and began to speak as though they were uttering a prophetic word from God. Thus saith the Lord, we're in the tribulation. He said, that's not true. I don't care if they say, thus saith the Lord. I don't care what it sounds like. I don't care if they wave your Bible at you as the mindset here, all right? If it doesn't line up with the word of God, then, then don't believe it. It's not real. Or even if it comes by report. The idea here is of people sitting around and having conversation. Hey, have you heard? You know, have you heard? Hey, what's the latest? Uh, well, here's the latest. Have you heard that, uh, that we're, in the, we're in the tribulation? We're in the tribulation. We're in the tribulation. This is the, I knew something was wrong. <laughs> and then it begins to go around, we're in the tribulation. He said, or even by a letter. Apparently somebody had written some letters, forged the apostle's name to him and says, this is the truth, this is Paul speaking. So that wasn't me that wrote it. If you get that letter, it didn't come from me. So don't, don't think that we're in the tribulation because of anything you've heard here. He said, because certain things are going to have to happen first. In fact, the very first thing he brings their attention back to is the issue he talks about is the apostasy of the church. And we dealt with eight weeks on the apostasy of the church and what would lead up to that great apostate church in the end times, about the rejection of the truth, about people who didn't want to hear the truth in the last days, who would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, give me a preacher that's going to tell me what I want to hear. I'm not interested in the truth. I just want what I want to hear. I want to go away from church, feel like I've been elevated, and I feel better about myself, and I love myself even more. That's the, pretty much the mindset of the last days. He said there'll be a denial of the scriptures as being the truth of God's word. There'll be preachers who, you know, they, they won't embrace the truth of God's word. I dealt with this dealing with our Belizean pastors. And, and this is a reason, by the way, folks, that our conferences are so important that we do. Because uh, some of us sit in church Sunday when we hear preaching the word of God. But, you know, we have preachers and elders and teachers in our church that believe the word of God. And we just kind of assume that everybody does that. And it, everybody doesn't do that. When I was in Belize recently, I, I remember speaking to a pastor. He said, you know, we have a Bible school here that's come over and volunteered to teach our pastors. He said, one of the first classes I sat in, I heard something kind of unusual. I want to know what you think. I said, what would you hear? He said, well, the professor got up and he said this. This is the Bible. It contains the Word of God. I said, well, you're right to catch that. Because it doesn't contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It's inerrant, it's inspired of God, it's infallible, it is the Word of God. All right? But not everybody believes that. There's whole denominations that don't believe that in the world today and teaching other preachers and people around the world not to believe that. Well, they believe the Bible is just inspired in some places. You know, like we've said before, it's inspired in spots, and I guess we're inspired to spot the spots. That's the way it all breaks down. Well, I don't have to worry about looking for the inspired spot because the whole thing is inspired of God. And so he's saying, hey, there's going to come this day in the end of times, though, when people will not believe that, you know. He said they're, going to, they're not going to believe the truth. So let nobody in any way deceive you. Because what's going to have to happen before this judgment is this apostasy has to come. And the lawless one is going to be revealed, the son of perdition, you know. Now, by the way, the only antidote to heresy, and this is where Paul's moving towards, this in correction, the only antidote to heresy is truth. And so he's preaching the truth. In fact, he tells them there's three events that are going to have to occur first. If before this happens, one is this apostasy is going to take place. The apostasy. And the second thing is this. You'll see this revelation. There's going to be an exposing of the, uh, of the man of sin, the lawless one. And the third thing is this. Then you're going to see the removal of restraint against lawlessness in verses 6 and 7. 7. And so he's, he's, he's asserting the day of the Lord hadn't yet begun, and here's why it hasn't begun. These are the facts why it hasn't begun. Number one is the apostasy. This rebellion has not yet taken place. The apostasy has to come. In fact, when he says the apostasy, he's not just talking about any apostasy, because, you know, we stated about apostasy as a rebellion, rejection of the truth. It's not somebody who was saved and then loses their salvation or loses, you know. No, this is, this is people who were, who were like the wheat and tear. They never were the real thing. They were always weeds. They never were wheat. They were always the tear. All right? This is, this, is, this is those people who come along and have a form of godliness that Paul talked about, but they deny the power of it. They'll talk about God. They love Jesus. They love the Bible, but they really don't. 
It's all pretense. It's all words. They reject the lordship of Jesus Christ over their life, and they live for themselves. They just like to drape themselves with a pseudo-religiosity and kind of wear that like a banner in their life. He said, you know, those people, you know, they haven't, they haven't really been truly born again. They haven't embraced the truth, so they easily fall away from the truth. They were kind of in line, but never on target, so to say. In fact, there's this definite article that's used when he talks about the apostasy, all right? In other words, he's not just saying it's some departure from faith, it's some rebellion against the Word of God, but he's talking about a very particular falling away and a very widespread falling away. Now, that hasn't happened until recent generations, all right? In recent generations, we are seeing this apostasy, and again, we dealt with it for eight weeks, so I'm not going to labor long here. This apostasy has come to this head, and it's going to come even more so to a head in the last of days. In fact, the book of Revelation talks about, makes a reference to the scarlet whore in Revelation chapter 17. This is what Paul's talking about in 2 Timothy when he says, they will not endure sound doctrine. In other words, if you preach the truth, they will get rid of you. They want to heap to themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. People with itching ears. Well, we can see that happening today, can't we? On every hand, on every corner, let's turn on TV, listen to radio. You see it all around us. All these people gathering in so-called name of Jesus, but they really don't have any commitment to Jesus. There's this pseudo-Christianity. And what's going to happen, and what Paul is saying, you're going to know you're in the tribulation because all these people are going to unite under one group. It's going to be under one banner. It's going to be under one, under one roof, and they will, they will be pagan worshipers who will ultimately you know, worship the Antichrist. If you guys don't see that, it's happening. Well, 2 Thessalonians, Paul wrote the church, and he says, and when those days come, God will send a strong delusion so that people will believe a lie. So in context with this, you might be thinking, well, if all those people wouldn't believe the Antichrist. God says, it's going to happen. Because once the spirit of grace, his ministry is now hindered because the church is absent, people are going to believe a lie. And not only are going to believe a lie, they're going to strongly embrace a lie and choose to live a lie. He says, you're going to have to see the apostasy come. And when you see it, Hey, you know that the, the, the tribulation is nigh and upon us. And then he talked about also in verse 3, the lawless one. This is the event has take place. You know, bef- right prior to the judgments of the day of the Lord occurs is this man of lawlessness. He's revealed. In fact, he kind of uses the idea, the tense of the verb here is the lawless one will be revealed. It, it, it seems to indicate it's a revelation, this kind of decisive moment. All of a sudden, Antichrist is going to be on the scene. Now, he may well be alive today, and I think we probably waste a lot of time if we're trying to say, well, you know, I thought Kissinger was the Antichrist, or Nixon, you know, or Clinton, or Obama. Everybody's got a formula, or it's the Russian president, or it's the guy, you know, you know it's from somewhere, from somehow, and, you know, he's the Antichrist because the, his number comes out when you take the numbers of his name, and we do the math, and on and on it goes. Uh, just don't run my name through that formula. My, my name might pop up, Amen. So what's he saying here? There's going to be this definite revelation of someone who is the Antichrist. There's going to be this unveiling. And he's going to be so powerful and so charismatic and so, so persuasive that everybody's going to embrace him. In fact, when it says to be revealed, again, it's that word we get the word apocalypse from. So a lot of people talk about the apocalypse, and they think only about the judgments, you know, and how the earth, you always hear these post-apocalyptic movies, and everything's in ruin, there's no power, there's no food, everybody's killing everybody, we have all these, you know, kind of movies that go out about that. Listen, the apocalypse is the unfolding and the revelation of Jesus Christ, all right? He is the apocalyptic one, basically. They're going to see him east to west, north to south, they're going to know him when he arrives. He's going to appear in glory, all right? But there's also this kind of little mini apocalypse, this little pseudo apocalypse that takes place around the Antichrist. And he's characterized in lots of different ways in the scripture. And there's so many things we could say, but let's just, let's just take a few scriptural points. One, he's fully associated and characterized by what? Lawlessness, all right? Which absolutely puts him in contrast to, to the, the God of glory and the God of grace. In fact, you know, uh, it's just absolute lawlessness. In fact, he's characterized as being opposed to God's law in another place. He's also characterized as a man doomed to destruction. King James puts it like this, the son of perdition. 
This is a man who's going to be received, accepted as this great world leader and savior to the world. He's also uh, seemed to be associated with Judas as being the spirit, that, that same spirit that filled Judas Iscariot, making him the son of perdition, will also make the Antichrist the son of perdition. What does that mean? The son of perdition means that he's doomed to destruction. There's no hope for him. Just as much as we are now destined in Christ Jesus for eternal salvation, eternal life, eternal fullness, this perdition, destruction, is just the opposite of that. We have abundant life in Christ, and we experience on a greater, more intimate level every day, and then ultimately, when we become like him, the fullness of that. The Antichrist, on the other hand, experiences just the opposite of that. He experiences eternal death, eternal doom, eternal destruction, everlasting torment. Elsewhere in Scripture, he goes by several other names. Daniel talked to him in, in quite a few places, and he refers to him as the little horn. In Daniel chapter 9, he's called the prince that shall come. In Daniel chapter 11, he calls him the willful king. In 1 John, he's referred to simply as the Antichrist will come. In Revelation 13, he's called the beast that is coming out of the sea. In Revelation 17, he is called a scarlet beast. And also in that same chapter in Revelation, also in chapter 19 and chapter 20, he's referred to as the beast. Ultimately, he's the Antichrist of 1 John 2, 18. Not just Antichrist, he's opposite Christ. Everything Jesus is, he's not. He's the opposite. Jesus offers life, promises life, gives life. The Antichrist offers life, promises life, gives death. Gives misery. Offers peace, but no peace. The Bible says, we read earlier in 1 Thessalonians, peace and safety come. Not going to be peace and safety under Antichrist. It's just a message that's being preached. He can't offer it. He's a real human being, by the way. He's not a system. He's not a principle. He's not a succession of individuals. I've heard all kinds of stories about the, the Antichrist. But he's a real human being who will have his place on the stage of human history. He's, he's the ultimate personification of Satan and the culmination of everything that opposes God. But yet he will be worshipped. Again, we don't need to speculate who he's going to be or when he's going to be. The Bible says in Mark 13, Jesus says, Concerning the day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven. Ezekiel prophesied of him in chapter 42 when he talked about the, 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 the divided cities of Jerusalem and the divided place and Antichrist is going to solve the, devol, the, the divisions of, of, of the Middle East and the strife in the Middle East. In fact, he'll come up with a plan that seems so glorious and so wonderful. Everybody say, he's such a hero. He's such a great man. Paul said, it hasn't happened yet, so don't be shaken. It hasn't occurred yet. You're not in the tribulation. This is not the day of the Lord just yet. You didn't miss the rapture because the son of perdition, the Antichrist, has not yet come. The scriptures make it very clear and indicate on more than one occasion the Lord will not come until certain things take place in the future. And these things are happening and beginning to culminate, and I believe we're very near these moments it's possible, as I say, the Antichrist has already been born. He may be a young man. He may be a child. He may be a full-grown adult. All that we're waiting for is a revelation of this individual. And I think what will bring the revelation of this individual is the Lord Jesus Christ appearing for the church. So I'm not looking for Antichrist. I'm looking for Christ. All right? I'm looking for the hope of glory. My expectation is not on this man of sin. My expectation is upon the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Paul is doing with the Thessalonians is trying to tell them, don't look for anything else but the blessed hope. Don't be shaken. You know? get, get these things in order. You can live with confidence. You can trust God. Your responsibility is to live the way God wants you to live, to honor God with your life, and to fulfill the mission that God has called you to fulfill. There's a lot of people even that are excited about the Lord Jesus' return, but they're not doing what Jesus told them to do. Jesus prophesied that. He said, there's going to be a lot of people that show up when the master shows up. They weren't doing what the master said, and those servants are going to be ashamed. 
I don't want to fall in that category, and I don't believe any of us in this room want to fall in that category. So if we do believe the Lord is coming soon, and we do believe that we're on that door of that generation, on that unveiling of the Antichrist, on that moment where the, where the, the apostasy culminates itself with a one world religion, if we're right at that door, Boy, we ought to be looking out more than any other times. And we ought to be faithful to the commandment that the Lord Jesus has given us. It says this man's going to characterize and exalt himself above everything that's called God and declare himself to be God. But we, on the other hand, we know who God is. And we know who God's Son is. And if we truly do believe that, I mean, if I really do believe that, then I need to be doing exactly what the Lord Jesus told me to and be about going therefore and making disciples of all nations. That's what God has called you to. That's what God has called me to. We should be reaching as many people as possible in Spring, in Magnolia, in Harris County, in Montgomery County, in Texas, Louisiana, the United States, outside the United States, anywhere that we get an open door, we ought to be running through it with the message that Jesus is Lord and Jesus saves and he's coming again. Hallelujah. That's what God's called us to. And before we get too excited and to start clapping too much, let me remind you, you know, that's not just a nice verse which we applaud and say that's kind of an anthem for our church. It's what we do, and if we're not doing it, then we're backslidden. Not just as a corporate group of people who've committed ourselves through missions and ministry to do that as a church, but as individuals. Where's your witness? Where's the word that comes out of your mouth? Who are you seeking to disciple in your own life? Who are you seeking to lead to Jesus in your own life? The Bible says we must work the works of him while it is still day because night is coming when that work will not be carried out. That work's not going to be carried out. So we have to get back to realize that, that we're living in these days. Antichrist is soon to make his revelation moment and he will come with an answer. I want you to know every president since I have been alive has been focused on doing one thing and everyone with, without exception has failed and that's to bring peace in the Middle East. Isn't that right? Yes. Well, we're going to have our Camp David meetings. We're going to do these meetings. We're going to do those meetings. No peace. And there will be no real peace until the Prince of Peace comes and reigns supreme over the end times. Our responsibility is to be preparing the way and reaching people for Christ, living a life that will cause people to say, hey, I want what they've got. I need a change in my life. I need to be moving towards this moment with an expectation, but also with obedience because the time of our departure is close at hand. Well, we won't be doing this anymore. We've been called to be faithful. We need to be faithful. I know we're living in Texas and you've probably all heard the Boudreaux and Thibodeau jokes, right? The Cajun jokes Stories about the Louisiana game warden who'd been trying to track down Boudreaux the poacher for a long time and never could catch him. So one day while he was stumbling through the woods, the game warden realizes he's just found this criminal's cabin. He's found Boudreaux's hideout and he sneaks up on the roof in the middle of the night to wait for Boudreaux to come out in the morning. Long, hard, cold night. Morning breaks and he begins to smell coffee brewing. Oh, it smells so good. He's getting a little restless on the roof. Then he hears the sizzle of bacon hitting the griddle. Coming up the chimney, he smells, and then the eggs, he can hear them being cracked. His Boudreaux is fixing breakfast. Finally, Boudreaux, he hears him shuffling around and opens the front door, and Boudreaux calls out, Hey, Mr. Game Warden, you might as well come on down and have some breakfast with me. Game Warden kind of comes down and slides off the roof and goes in to sit down and have breakfast with Boudreaux. He says, Boudreaux, how did you know I was up there? Boudreaux said, I didn't know, but I do that every morning just in case you are. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be best for us to practice something every morning. Be ready to be, have a sense of expectation. All right, Jesus is coming. Now, in case you didn't hear that, let me say it one more time. Jesus is coming, and he's coming sooner than what most of us realize. I know there's some sitting here today. I talked with somebody just last Tuesday. The office in Magnolia, you sat down, and I was trying to tell him about the fact Jesus is coming. Get a sense of urgency in him. Oh, 
People have been saying that forever. I'll tell you when Jesus is coming. When you die, that's when Jesus is coming. The world ends when you die. I said, no, it doesn't. Doesn't end for me, doesn't end for you. When you die, you're going to step into eternity. And this world is going to keep on going until Jesus comes. All right? So don't think it's when you die. Rodney, you were sitting there with me, weren't you? I'm thinking, but no, it doesn't. Now, let me tell you, sometimes it's just best to let things go. <laughs> but let me say, I don't care what your particular belief is. Or you're trying to say, well, everybody's been saying for a long time. No, Jesus is literally in person coming again. Just as he came 2,000 plus years ago in that little manger, lay that little baby, God in the flesh, he came, his parousia, his presence was manifest first time. Coming back, second time. Himself, real. He's not sending the committee. He's not sending the denominational board. He's coming himself in person. Not this time as little baby Jesus lying in a manger lapped, wrapped in swaddling clothes, but he's coming as the mighty king of kings and the mighty Lord of hosts, and he's coming to take over. Amen. Hallelujah. We need to be ready for that moment. So I'd ask you today if you are. Pretty simply, I mean, that's about the simplest question anybody could ever ask you. Are you ready? The only thing that makes you ready is not say, well, I'm a member of the church. That's what the apostates are saying. I've been good. My pappy was a preacher. My mama was a Bible, Bible student and a Bible Sunday school teacher. My grandpa believed the Bible. I'm not asking about your grandpa. I'm not asking about aunt whoever. I'm asking you. Is if you were the only person in this room, can you hear the question, are you ready? And the only thing that makes us ready is if we've received Christ in our hearts by faith. He's provided a way of salvation by giving himself as the offering and a substitute for my sin. He took my place and he took your place. And the only thing that makes you ready is not if you have that information internally stored somewhere, is if you have a personal heart commitment to Jesus Christ. He's your Lord and Savior. You have a relationship with him that is based upon the word of God and it's real and he's real and he's changed your life. Has that ever happened? Then you're not ready if it hasn't. And I would encourage you today, get ready. How do I get ready? Give your heart and your life to Christ today. As a Christian, the Bible says when he appears on that day, many will be ashamed. I don't want to be in the ashamed category. I don't want to be saying, I believe God's told us to go, but I don't go. I believe God's told us to give, but I don't give. I believe God told me to be righteous, but I'm not acting righteous. That's embarrassing. Nobody likes being found out. When absolute truth and absolute light are manifest, we're all going to be found out for where we really are and what we really believe. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, I thank you today that we have these great promises that aren't just words scattered on a piece of paper.